They were given a pressure 1.30 atmosphere and a change in volume of 7.9 liters. And sometimes you will see the term external pressure, that means pressure from that side, or you just see the word pressure. In this case, if they ask you to find work, then obviously you would use this and not minus delta nRT because you don't have n or t. So you'd say minus p, 1.30 atmospheres, times delta b, 7.9, and then you would just convert, it's 101.325 joules per one liter atmosphere. And in this case, I got 1.0 uh, kilojoules. So the other kind of problem is just a simple plug and chug. There's no reaction. There could be a, usually no reaction involved. It's just some external pressure pushing on some volume. Okay? So that'd be the other kind of work problem. All right. I would like to do a demo before I go to the next section. I need somebody's help. But I need somebody who is tactile, who has a good sense of touch. Okay, who is that? Oh, no, that's unfortunate. Okay. Maybe you walked here last time. Okay. Uh, Olivia. Okay. Stand up. Bunch of clothes. Okay. okay. I have a big bubble. Okay. So, uh, I have here. Do the do and can. The a soda can is made of what metal? <laughs> aluminum. And on the outside, there's usually it oxidizes, so there's aluminum oxide in aluminum. Okay, a tin can is made of what? Not tin. They don't do that. Anymore. It's just call tin. What's it made of? Iron. Iron. Okay. All right. What I'm going to do? I'm going to hand you these two cans. They're both obviously at the same temperature, room temperature. But I want you to tell me which one feels warmer and which one feels colder. Okay? And this is just going to be approximation. I didn't have two things of equal mass exactly, but I'll kind of get the point. Are you ready? There's no explosion if that's what you was thinking. It's just she's going to tell me which one's warmer and which one's colder. You ready? You told her, hands out in the grabbing position. Sorry, here we go. Yes, okay, awesome. Okay, yes, this one feels colder. This one feels warmer. You can take a seat, thank you. That was excellent. You can email me for a Yes, it's hot. Okay. Why? Why would this, how is it even possible that something feels warmer if it's at the same temperature? You can even do this, uh, like, you know, around, you can feel your seat versus the metal that's holding your desk versus your desk. They will feel warmer or colder at the same temperature. It's kind of weird, but the reason that happens is exactly related to the concept we're in. And it can be explained in different ways, but related to our concept. Remember I showed you this last time, the specific heats? See that iron has a, is a smaller number than aluminum. Okay, so aluminum going to hold its warmth better, and it's going to feel warmer. The iron will give it away more, and another way to explain it's a conductor. So the iron is going to feel colder than the aluminum at initial touch, even if they're at the same temperature, because it's more about exchanging heat rather than being at a different temperature. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard uh, if your family, for some reason, at Thanksgiving, a lot of people eat turkeys, okay? And you have to thaw the turkey. One way to do it is to thaw it as a normal humanoid. But another way to do it is, uh, is any of your families ever put it on a metal block? And when you that, there's this miracle, miracle thaw. You put it on a metal block, usually aluminum, uh, because it feels warmer, it's going to help thaw the turkey rather than if it's just sitting out in the air. So that's another, same concept. Uh, it'll just kind of keep it warmer being on the metal versus being just in straight air. 
Okay. Let's go to section five. First law, first law. First law is the law of conservation of energy. I mentioned it a couple times. That's the main concept we've been using, especially for heat problems. Law of conservation of energy. That means the energy of the universe is constant. Okay? It's not, there's no uh, energy created or destroyed. By the way, does this law hold true still? Yeah, there's a lot of asterisks after this law. Really, it would be more correct to say it's the law of conservation of mass and energy. Because mass and energy is interconvertible. So, uh, mass and energy are conserved, to be more specific. But in the problems we're doing, energy will be conserved. We're not doing any nuclear reactions, so we're cool. We're going to talk about U, uh, the total or internal energy. Total or internal energy. This includes kinetic energy and potential energy. All the total energy is what we call U, and this would be the internal energy, is what we'll call it. And this describes, if you have a system, if there's Q, heat, or W, work, transferred across the system, we're adding that up to uh, be part of U, the internal energy, okay? So specifically, what we're going to say is the change in U between the systems and the surroundings, okay, the change in U between the system and the surroundings is equal to Q plus W. This is the equation, one of the ways, the equation to write out the first law. Another way to say that is the only energies transferred across the boundary are heat and work. Okay? So heat and work are the only energy that's going across the boundary. So if you calculate a change in U, the energy from the inside to the outside, then it has to be the, only, the energies that are going across the boundary, heat and work. That's the first law of thermodynamics. First law of thermodynamics. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm gonna say more, and I'll refer to this page later, but uh, maybe we'll get to it at the end of the class. On page 13 of the reader, if you want to see that, all of the energies that we're covering in this class is summarized on page 13. So the internal energy is the total amount of energy contained within the system boundary. Okay, let's take for fun, because we like fun. Fun follows me around, you know what I mean. So, isolated system. What would Q equal in an isolated system and what would work? Both would be zero because no energy goes across a boundary in an isolated system. Thus, okay, see if you can get this right. U equals not necessarily zero, just a constant. It's not going to change because nothing's going across the boundary. But delta U will equal zero. Delta U equals zero. Okay, because Q plus W is zero, so delta U is zero. Okay. Uh, is there a true isolated system, I think, is what you're asking? Yeah, no. That's hard to say. No. But what we can approximate, and the math will work just fine, yes, we can approximate isolated systems. And that happens a lot. Yeah, a true isolated system, the hard part is you just need to contain all the energy, which is a little difficult. But you can pretty much do that if you want to. Close enough as far as we'd be concerned. Okay, some people, somebody was asked me afterwards, you can ask philosophically, is the universe, what kind of system is it? Is it an open system or a closed system? Can that energy go across the boundary? Can matter go across the boundary? Or is it isolated? It's totally contained. So that could be an example you can discuss in your philosophy class. Okay, uh, let me draw a little picture here. Here's our system. Okay. Uh, heat, Q, 
When that goes into the system, that is what? Positive or negative? Positive. And uh, we would call that what? Thermic. Blink. Oh. Endothermic. Okay, let's try another one. I just wanted to find the signs here. Work. Okay, I want to specify this one because I haven't specified this one yet. When work is done, and we would use the terms on the system, when it's going in, when it's done on the system, we consider this a positive. Okay? When work is done by, so the preposition is important. When work is done by the system, it's going outwards and it's negative. So I like to think, uh, I used to use uh, uh, Paris Hilton, but she's not as popular anymore. So Kim Kardashian, whoever, <laughs> Chloe, whoever your favorite is. It is a positive experience in the winter when they're warm. Okay, so when heat goes into the system, they're happy. Okay, that's positive. When work is done on the system, they're also positive experience. Okay, it's like be a mnemonic that you can remember. When work is done on the system, that's experience, uh, a positive experience for Kim. Or when when she's warm, that's a positive experience for her. So thus, energy, the big one, energy. Overall energy on the system, uh, thus delta U would be greater than zero or positive in this case. If both heat and work are positive, then energy would be positive going into the system. Okay? So going into the system is positive, going out is negative. Whether it be heat evolved, negative, or work done by the system is a negative experience. Okay? That's how we define our signs. So be comfortable with our signage. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of examples on YouTube I would like to point out just so you can take a look at them. Uh, let's see. There's, and these are all mentioned in the reader if you want to take a look. Bomb calorimeter, there's a ton of heat problems, some of them easy, some of them hard. Uh, there, so they're all called heat problem. There's a video called, literally called work mentioned on page 9. There's a, so a ton of videos. I recommend you taking a look at these. Okay? There's a first law. This is mentioned on page 10. First law 1 through 6, just to see some first law math problems or concept problems. Uh, so I just want to point those out. Those are all mentioned in the reader. I recommend you got to see examples to understand how to do this stuff. Okay. Two types, types of functions. Let's see, in the reader, this is going to be page 10. In the textbook, this is going to be page uh, 464. Okay, number one, state, state function, state, state function. This is a function that is independent of path, okay? It's path independent, so path doesn't matter. For example, let's say I'm trying to get in lab to 70 degrees Celsius. I can heat up, and I accidentally pass it, and I go to 85. So, okay, I've got to cool down. Then I forget it's there, and I go down to 60. Then I heat up, I miss it again, I go to 75, and I finally cool down to 70, where I wanted to go, okay? Once I get there, I've got to the right place, and I don't care how much I missed it. So it's path independent. It does not matter to me if I went above, below, or I just went directly to 70 degrees. So temperature is an example of something that is path independent or a state function. Pressure is also a state function. Uh, amounts of something, like a mass, is a state function. And most important for us, uh, you. That internal energy is a state function. Okay? So this would be like a, an immoral person. If you wanna, if you wanna have a major and make money, let's say I want to be a doctor because I want to have a lot of money. I would say no. If you're immoral, you should be a drug dealer or like an investment banker or develop a Ponzi scheme or something like that. Okay. So there's much easier ways than med school. Ten years, that's ridiculous. School. Uh, to make lots of money. Okay, number two, path 
dependent path dependent function. This is, as you see, something that depends on path. So path is important. Let me do an example for us here. I'll take here uh, my version of the textbook. If I have it here, and let's say I want to move it to the other side of the table, okay? So I'm going to apply what kind of energy here? Work. I could. There's one way I could do it. I could go directly there, okay? Or I could go like this. Oh, I want to go this way. I want to do a loop to loop, and then I'll get there. Do you see how the second case would be a lot more work? Because I'm pushing it all around everywhere. So work is path dependent. If I go straight there, it's the least amount of work. If I take a wiggly path, then it's more work. So work and heat, and work's only what I'm describing today, but I'll just tell you that work and heat are path dependent functions. Okay. So it matters how you get there. This is the moral person. It's like, yes, I do. Okay, I don't want to be a drug dealer. So I will go to med school and, you know, spend 10 years and um, hundreds of thousand dollars because that's more whatever. Okay? So that's better. That's a path to him. How you get there matters. Okay, this is the end of section five. We're going to use this concept in the next section, which is section six. Oh my gosh, that's be so exciting. Heat of reaction. Can't stand it sometimes, right? We're going to talk about something called delta U. You already saw that one. And delta H. I alluded to delta H in the first lecture, but now I'm going to finally tell you what it is. Okay, let's say we had a reaction. R goes to P. So R, reactance is initial, P is final. So we'll have an initial U, internal energy, and a final total internal energy, okay? So this will overall be a change in U, and that'll be Q plus W according to the first law of thermodynamics, okay? Because this has to do with a reaction, I'm going to be more specific. I'll say Q R X N plus W because it's a heat of reaction. Okay, now we're gonna do two separate things. I'll do them in two separate colors. First in blue, let's consider this example in a bomb calorimeter. Bomb calorimeter. Delta V equals what? In a bomb calorimeter. Zero. There's no change in volume for a bomb calorimeter. So, let's go back to our equation. Delta U equals Q reaction, uh, and then work is minus P delta V. But delta V is zero. So in this case, delta U equals Q reaction, and just to define another term, because we really like to do that, uh, we'll call this Q sub V, meaning heat at constant volume. Just to remember, because Q reaction is more nebulous, if we're more specific, QV, we know this is Q at constant volume for this bomb color. Okay, so that's interesting. Delta U equals QV. Okay, let's look at another situation now. We'll do this in purple. Let's just take our, our world in general. So you can say, oh, this is a coffee cup, calorimeter or just our world in general, the problem is our world's not at constant volume because there's an air, expansion of air, and uh, contraction, but we are at constant pressure. Change in pressure equals zero. Let's take this situation now as an example. Well, delta U equals Q reaction plus W equals Q reaction minus P delta V. Now there's no canceling, because P is just a constant. But what I will do is say, well, Q reaction, just to be specific, this is, I'll put a little P as a subscript here. That means heat at constant pressure, in contrast to the other heat, which is at constant volume. 
So one's at constant pressure. And then minus P delta V. For fun, let's make another substitution. Q at constant pressure, what should we call that if we want another variable? Let's call it delta H. Okay, and this has a specific name we call enthalpy. H is enthalpy. And so uh, delta H would be changed in enthalpy. By the way, H is a state function. H is a state function. Okay. So, now we have these two things. Remind me, is U a state function? Is internal energy a state function? Yes, it is. So that means it is path, what? Independent. It doesn't matter how you get there, it's still the same. Right? Well, make sure you agree before you see the crazy happen. Okay. So it's path independent, it doesn't matter how it happens. We'll go to our new color now. So, delta U in the first case equals this. But in the second case equals this. And since it's path independent, it didn't matter how it got there. So they're equal. That's the crazy. They're equal, it doesn't matter which calorimeter I was using, because it's independent of path. Okay. So, uh, just to put in our substitutions here, QV is delta U, QP is uh, delta H, and this is minus P delta V. Or without the, uh, if you want to switch it around, sometimes people write it like this. You want to just move the terms around, positives. Or if you don't want the deltas, sometimes you'll see people write this. Either way, this is another way to write the first law. Another way to write the first law. We are going to use uh, the top two, mostly. Because you can't really measure the, some of these values outside of a change. So you can't really measure H too easily. So delta H or delta U uh, is much easier to measure. Remember that uh, delta U is just Q at constant volume. And delta H is Q at constant pressure. Okay. Now, how are we going to use this action? Uh, let me show you, but we have to warm up to how to use it. Let me give you a reaction. 3A goes to 2B, just as a sample reaction. And let's say delta H equals 100 kilojoules. So now you're going to notice I'm going to stop using Q, or Q at constant pressure, I'm going to start using delta H now. Remember, it's just heat. Same thing. I'm just going to use another variable now. And this is pretty constant across the literature. We use enthalpy or change in enthalpy. We're not going to write Q. All right, so every reaction will have a delta H. By the way, this is blank thermic. Endo, if it's positive. Remember? Positive number, endothermic. Negative number would be exothermic. Okay. What does this 100 mean? It means the following. You can write 100 kilojoules per 3 moles of A. Or you can write 100 kilojoules per 2 moles of B. So that's what the delta H term means in, with regards to a reaction. Okay? So when you be familiar with that, sometimes we're going to see a reaction, and you'll need to do that. Cool. Like now. I'll read this because it looks a little funny. Oh, let me get that. That glare is out of the way. One mole of methane is burned at constant pressure. 890 kilojoules of energy is released as heat. Calculate delta H for a process in which a 5.8 gram sample of methane is burned at constant pressure. Okay. So when one mole of methane is burned at constant pressure, 890 kilojoules of uh, energy is released as heat. Calculate delta H for a process 
which a 5.8 gram sample of methane is burned at constant pressure. This is a pretty typical type of problem. This is going to involve enthalpy specifically. So let's give this one a try. Overhead, blink overhead. This is one shot. Okay, methane, CH4. If you're curious, combustion again. We saw this reaction a couple times now today. H2O, so we need a two here and two. We don't really need the reaction to do this, but uh, there's 890 kilojoules of energy. And uh, this is Q, P, heat of constant pressure, or delta H. Now, is it a positive or negative number? I know that says positive there. Yeah, that's not what I'm asking. What should it be? It should be negative. Because what keyword? The keyword is released. It's released, given off, evolved, etc. It's a negative. Okay. Now, our key uh, compound is methane in this case. How many moles of methane do I have right now? If you look at the reaction, there's one mole. Do you see that? Just a one. Should be a one here. So I can put down here, just like my previous example, one mole of methane. So that's how much is released for one mole of methane, or if you wanted, two moles of O2, or one mole of CO2, or two moles of H2O. But we care right now about methane, so that's what I'm focusing on. Okay, I don't have one mole in my question, I have 5.8 grams. So this is a delta H conversion problem, okay? I need to convert from moles to grams. Let's do that. So I'm going to take this 890 kilojoules per mole, CH4, and now I'm purely going to do a 2A conversion. I go from moles to gram using what? The molar mass from the periodic table, 16 grams per mole of methane. And I uh, have, in this case specifically, 5.8 grams. So in this case, I will get for 5.8 grams, negative 320 kilojoules of energy given off, and that's delta H for this specific problem. Remember, delta H is the heat at constant pressure, or it's the energy of reaction, okay? Heat of reaction. Any questions on that? Okay, I want to mention something here. Let me move this out of the way. I'll put it back in a second. First of all, a bunch of YouTube videos you can take a look at, Empathy 1 through 4. But I want to discuss this on the next page here. This is a table, I believe it's posted online too, this is page 13, or on our smart site, you don't have the reader. Let me talk through all the different types of energies we've seen so far. The reason is students can get confused sometimes, and so I, I just want to clarify. Okay. Temperature. Temperature we saw in chem 2 ways related to kinetic energy. They're proportional. It's basically the measure of the energy in the system. Now, kinetic energy has to do with motion. Potential energy is stored energy. And that for a compound is its condition, its state, its composition, etc. Thermal energy, we saw that already too. That's associated with random molecular motion. So for chemicals uh, or molecules, collisions. We've seen heat. That's the energy transferred across a boundary because of a temperature difference. Uh, and not always, but a temperature difference in this example. And so uh, work also is across a boundary. And that has to do with variables, whether pressure, change in volume, etc. Chemical energy is potential energy, of, uh, a subset of potential energy. 
has to do with the uh, energy in the system of the bonds. There's heat of reaction. That's, again, a subset of Q. It's a type of Q. And that's the uh, quantity of heat transformed into reaction. There's internal energy. That's the total amount of energy in the system. And then we've seen enthalpy, which is the heat at constant pressure. So these are all the energies. This is the most you're going to see. We will see two more at the end of the quarter in chapter 18. But this is what we've got so far. So I wanted to call your attention to this because students often get confused. Hey, what's what? Refer to this as you're kind of learning the terms. 